as we know, you know, satire, humour, they, they were the staple. They were essential. They kept the big citizens, they, they cut them down to size. They Political satire was a way of the little people, people like you and me, private citizens, getting back at our over-mighty uh, overlords. And so there's no question that throughout history, humour has been absolutely essential. And it's oft, oft quoted, you know, the minute you start laughing at someone, you, you stop fearing them. And laughter is a, a very, very potent weapon. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success, mental health, and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a passionate and popular multi-award winning historian, author and television presenter. He won a first class degree in history at Balliol College, Oxford, where he developed a passion for military history, specialising in the First World War. He has made numerous TV programmes, including presenting the 200th anniversary celebration of the Battle of Trafalgar and the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II. His easy style makes him equally at home presenting big topics like Battlefield Britain or lighter items on the one show. In the 2019 Queen's Birthday Honours list, he was awarded an MBE for Services to History. Perhaps unsurprisingly, his History Hit podcast is a huge hit and has rightly had humongous praise heaped on it. Dan Snow, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. Ah, it's great to have you here. I was listening to you speak recently and you said that Napoleon being short was an urban myth and made up by British politicians, press and PR. Was that an early example of weaponizing humour? Yes, it probably was, but it's definitely... Poking fun at people, of course, is, is eternal. I think that, in fact, if you go back and look... I was reading a book the other day. What anthropologists have you know, worked with uh, people still living very traditional lifestyles around the world, and they've discovered that humour was essential. In fact, picking on or or keeping pe chiefs, leaders down to size by using humour, by kind of criticising in a playful way, is essential to all of our uh, most most fundamental ways of being. So Napoleon was about five foot six, five foot seven. So you know he wasn't tall, but he certainly wasn't you know very very short, and he was a, a kind of average for the time. In fact, and it was yeah largely British propaganda. They said he was a sort of a short little short little Napoleon Bonaparte. Part. But yeah, I don't think that I think we've been doing that through history. I think we've been doing it through for through all of our recorded history. What do you think that uh, that history has taught us about humour? If you like, is it important in our our history? Has it changed anything? Well, it's certainly changed a lot of things, isn't it? But I, th I think, like I just you know, as, as we let's, let's start way back, Stone Age societies, pre-industrial societies hunter-gatherer societies. Humour, we know, was essential uh, we, because we, we we can ask them. They still exist in, in some very small parts of the world and anthropologists have been studying them since the 19th century. And we know that humour is one of the mechanisms that we all use to cement group ethos, ideology, uh, build teams, build relationships. Humour is like singing. It's one of these strange things we're able to do because we're able, our mouths evolved and our tongues and our teeth evolved in a certain way that we're able to make funny noises. We're able to talk in a way that uh, is, is, well, we think is pretty unique in the, in the animal world. Other, other animals can sing, they can, they can make noises, but we can construct these incredibly, you know, we can, we can invent communism or uh, persuade someone to lend us a fiver. You know, these things, no, no one else, could, no, no other animals uh, that we know of have done these things. And so whilst we can talk and invent complicated political ideas and convince people to do insane stuff, like die on our behalf, we can inspire young men to jump out of a trench and go and run towards almost certain death. Uh, we, we are also able to laugh and and an appeal to that side of us. And so, yeah, it's essential. Of course it is. If you go back and look at ancient Athens, 
the Festival of Dionysus, the plays that were written and performed on the edge of the Acropolis and the theatres there. As we know, you know, satire, humour, they, they were the staple. They were essential. They kept the big citizens, they, they cut them down to size. They Political satire was a way of the little people, people like you and me, private citizens, getting back at our over-mighty uh, overlords. And so there's no question that throughout history, humour has been absolutely essential. And it's oft, oft quoted, that, you know, the minute you start laughing at someone, you, you stop fearing them. And laughter is a, a very, very potent weapon. Is that why totalitarians tend to close down the media um, that I think in apartheid, one of the things that happened was they stopped comedy, they stopped uh, uh, plays being performed. Is that because totalitarian regimes fear that pricking of the bubble of pomposity? I think exactly that. So I just did a podcast on st humour in the age of Stalin. And Stalin's secret police kept huge reams of material. What were the jokes? Who was telling them? Why were the jokes? They had to sort of, you know, these. So actually, it's quite useful if you're looking for humor in the age of Stalin. The, the NKVD and the government's security apparatus wrote them all down. See so that the, the researchers can just go through them all. And as you say, it pricked the bubble of their pomposity. I remember growing up, you know, the particularly satirical era, Spitting Image was a big show here in the UK, which involved sort of puppets uh, of famous people doing absurd things. And then we had, you know, the, the relentless assault on sort of Reagan and Thatcher that you got in, on the comedy and everywhere. And I just remember growing up thinking that my politicians were like figures of absurd, figures of fun almost, absurd. You know, John Major, we used to love it. In the sort of post-George W. Bush era, enter Brexit, post-2009, sort of the global economic collapse, the politicians appear a bit more sinister. You know, Putin, Bolsonaro burning the rainforest, Putin doing his things, Orban dismantling democracy here in Europe. You know, their, their president, Xi, it's kind of, it's less funny now because it's all much more disturbing. But certainly in the 90s, the 80s, 90s, when I was growing up, I mean, I, I can't remember. What the, I remember thinking, how could anyone be a politician? They just, we, just, we just clownify them all immediately. It's brutal. We were interviewing uh, Rick Wilson, who's the, one of the founders of the Lincoln Project in America. I wonder how much difference it actually made to, to uh, the toppling of Trump. Do you think that we've lost some of that in, in the UK at the moment or generally in the world? The humour, like spitting image that you mentioned, um, that, that can actually topple power. Well, I think we've got that. It's a, that bleeds into our the perennial problem that we all talk about in all our podcasts at the moment, which is kind of in, you know information ecosystems, doesn't it? And th sorry, two parallel problems. One is that sometimes things are so bad they're not funny. It, um, you know, so how how could you make how can you make jokes about Bolsonaro who or or, or who or Mo, you know, these new populists Modi, Bolsonaro, Trump, Johnson who are uh, mishandled COVID. Uh, in the case of Bolsonaro, is just destroying some of the most vital resources on planet Earth. You know, I'm not super excited about laughing about those guys. Like, I don't know, you've got to make their core, somehow we've got to reach their core audience to make them laugh. Like, I mean, I don't think it's very funny, Like, but you need to sort of undermine them. And I think that the kind of the buffering that we've all been able to, insulation we've all been able to place around our kind of information means that, I, I was a regular user of the Lincoln Project as a middle-aged, affluent white guy that was never going to have any sympathy for Trump anyway. I thought the Lincoln Project was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. It was brilliant. The trouble is, I've, the, so a lot of their post-mortems suggest that it was people like me who were receiving all that propaganda who just didn't. It didn't need to, like I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't need to be de-radicalized, you know. So whether or not you can direct that satire to the right places, I, I, I don't know. I think you know that this era of universally recognized satire comedy images memes it seems to be passing and, and these evil people in our world are just building this kind of absolutely armor plated silo where their where their followers can congregate and it's kind of difficult to penetrate that I, I think that's right but isn't uh, under in, in history terms haven't all totalitarian regimes closed down the media on some yeah. level in, yes, in order yes. to do that I mean yes this is what's so boring ab about the kind of arguments about Trump and f there's a very boring debate within the world of history at the moment whether Trump is actually a fascist in the traditional in its correct sense of the word because is he a mid-century or early 20th century Italian you know like sh sure he may not actually be a dictionary definition of a fascist however it is a it is a fascistic thing to do to constantly delegitimize the press the day Hitler won power is fascinating some of the first targets he took out were 
uh, or instruments of the free press. There, there was a there was a newspaper in Bavaria that was day two in Hit when Hitler it, when the Nazis achieved power. That was stifled, shut down, attacked. You know the 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 the, the, the free flow of information and humor is part of that, of course, but of facts. The, the ability of people to access jokes of facts or anything that pricks the bubble of pomposity as you so brilliantly said earlier is ex is existentially threatening for these organizations and so for trump trump has incredibly successfully delegitimized all of the news outlets that published things that were true about him and he simply said don't worry about it folks they're all fake you no know, that's one of the most I mean, it's stunningly successful, uh, and and you've all we all we've all poured over the polling data. We've all seen the effect that's had on the Republican base. They do not believe in the reality that the rest of us uh, um, understand to be. So it's stifling jokes, all that stuff, and the the ways in which he, he, you know Trump was always very rude about Saturday Night Live, which was it, which remains a kind of powerful engine of humour in uh, and political humour in the US. But, you know, th these things, can, I don't know whether they get through or not, but there was the wonderful woman, Sarah Cooper, on TikTok, who did the miming yeah. of Trump. And everyone, I remember at the time, Dave Baddiel on Twitter was saying, oh, we've all wondered, when, when are we going to, when are these going to blows going to land on Trump? Because he's so absurd. He's such a joke that it's actually very difficult for comedians to tell him to a joke. Whereas Thatcher, you know, people like Thatcher, who, who were effective you know whatever you want to say about her politics, you know, she seems quite effective she seemed quite when, when comedians worked out how to get under her skin and, and turn thatcher it felt like a bit of a victory with trump it's it's too easy the fruit was too low hanging it was too hard and yet sarah cooper did come along with that miming in her house in her shower in her sort of kitchen and somehow somehow gave us a new insight into the, his absurdity, which I thought was very interesting. And yeah, wh whether or not that worked or got through to the right people, who knows? But it was, a, it was an example, I think, of humour landing blows where we'd been able to do so before. Well, it, it, it's funny that you mentioned Sarah Cooper because Joe Brand, I was talking to Joe Brand yesterday and she mentioned exactly the same thing. So it obviously had a cut through on many levels whereby... The absurdity was was magnified uh, to a level. Um, I'm interested that you mentioned Margaret Thatcher um, because we were interviewing William Hague, and William Hague said Margaret Thatcher didn't have a sense of humour at all. So, do you think that in modern day politics? People need to be more charismatic and have a sense of humour in order to cut through. Or somebody like Trump, who can just bash the press, will win more times than not. Uh, yes, it's very difficult, isn't it? I think, first of all, everything is, everything is very culturally dependent. I mean, what's very interesting is Hitler appeared so absurd in the uh, 20s and 30s to, there's a famous New York Times article, they go, this guy's just a complete idiot. He's a sort of, obviously, his little uniform he wears, his knickerbockers, his stupid little moustache. I mean, the guy's a fool, he's going nowhere. You know, and I, I, Boris Johnson wouldn't be elected anywhere else in the world. Donald Trump wouldn't be elected anywhere else. Nicola Sturgeon wouldn't be elected anywhere else in the world. But they, all, all, you know, these French presidents, these kind of, who the French will think, of, you know, we all think they're completely mental. But I mean, that's the, that's kind of the fascinating thing about humour. And I think, so it depends on the culture and the kind of, and the dominant. I mean, I think it's been a huge advantage of Boris Johnson that he does have a sense of humour, he can joke as well. I think he's, and he's, you know, he's a funny guy, he's, he's charismatic. I think Trump, weirdly, doesn't have a sense of humour, but is sort of, he's, he's charismatic, he's deeply charismatic, and he makes, he sort of makes jokes, doesn't he? Barbs. He, he's got kind of, I don't know, he's got kind of comic timing, I guess, that works for that audience. I think in a more, and, and that's in a kind of cut and thrust world of, media outlets and live streaming. A guy like Vladimir Putin, who doesn't exist in that world, a far more traditional media world where you control all the means of you know, communication. And he just goes and does these kind of press conferences once a year, which are kind of f fairly Soviet. I don't think he needs to be particularly charismatic or, or media friendly. So it very much depends on the system. Again, in a, in a traditional monarchical court, if you like, uh, you're Henry VIII, you got, you've got to have personal charisma. I think you need to, to, you know, you actually need to gather politicians around. You do, you slap backs, you shake hands, you if, issue patronage. I think you, you need to be more charismatic. I think the kind of giant totalitarian systems of the 20th century that emerged at the head of these huge, very sophisticated states, like that of the kind that still exists in China or in Russia. You don't have to be super charismatic of that because you are just the sort of sitting on this huge iron pinnacle. You have to, in Stalin's case, you had to kind of work, he had to work the Politburo. Yeah, sure. You know, he had to kill or charm 
the sort of 14, 15 key people around him to, to reach the top. But, but he didn't have to, you know, he didn't have to walk into a room like Barack Obama had to do uh, in Iowa when he was running for the Democrat, you know, nomination for president and, and properly chat and work a room, make self-deprecating jokes and then do that the next night, the next night, the next night. So it very much depends on the system and the culture, I think. Yeah, I was listening to your brilliant history hit podcast on Hitler and Stalin and weighing up. I mean, I have to say, neither of them seemed like a barrel of laughs, to be honest with you. Uh, but there was a different style, was there not? With, you know, I think it with Stalin was more about a, sort of getting people on board to a certain extent, where Hitler was leading from the front. Is that right? Yeah, Hitler was Hitler was profoundly charismatic. Again, within the uh, within the kind of slightly peculiar understandings of his own culture, like you know, we we would have found him weird, but he he, he worked at that time and that place, and he was you know, whipping up vast crowds. You know, had enormous his power seemed to derive from from his mastery of the public theatre. Stalin was a backroom guy who just went around sort of slitting throats and and twisting arms and 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 uh, yeah, and his so very 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 different indeed. Um, but uh, but once he'd reached the kind of top tier, he I don't think he you know but his public facing charisma was kind of irrelevant, and I suspect that's true of China. Although there, there doesn't seem to be much movement at the top of China anymore, you know it doesn't y you you don't have to appeal to a public opinion outside the very narrow group of opinion for like sort of decision makers within the top of that society. And in the same way you look at 18th century British prime ministers or some 19th century, you know, they were not they were not retail politicians. They didn't they didn't care what the public thought. They their 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 constituency was the narrow composition of the House of Commons and the King. And possibly one or two. You know, basically, that was it. And if they if they kept all those very small constituencies online, then they could they could be prime minister. They could be first lord of treasury. They they asking them to go out and make a barnstorming speech to an open air crowd in Manchester. They'd look like you got mad. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a great point and everything. Anyway, uh, we've we've wonderfully gone off on these uh, tangents. Uh, what makes you laugh, Dan? Uh, what makes me laugh? Uh, well. I just, my kids said this terrible thing to me the other day. They said, they said to me, you never laugh. And I thought, Jesus, that's right. When I'm with my kids, I probably don't, I don't like belly laugh that much, right? Because I'm too busy kicking their ass and telling them what to do and moving them in from car to car and arguing about dinner. But I do, contrary to what they think, I do laugh. I mean, I love, you know, I, I do love the, the sort of political, I love political humour, I love satire, I love the absurdity of poking fun at our leaders. The, the, if you don't laugh, you cry kind of stuff. I, I like the, you know, the sitting down with sort of fun and clever and articulate friends and and and, and sort of, just talking our way through the absurdity of of Boris Johnson's flip flopping on the Irish border around Brexit, you know, and they and and someone will throw in, you know, we just like you just like you just go for it, so goddamn stupid, or or Trump. I, I think I, you know Trump. I mean, you know, again, you're verging on these issues of kind of not laughing because it's all really really sad and disturbing. But um, I find that very funny. I used to find I used to find the kind of. Um, when I was younger and a uh, sort of bachelor and watched those kind of bachelor lad films, I used to love all those sort of Will Ferrell, um, anchorman -y sort of those, I loved all those films. I used to have, you know, thought they were all hysterical. Those are the, those are the films of my sort of formative years, which are always important. Oh, you know, old school anchorman, um, all those uh, ones. Um, what else makes me laugh? I, in terms of popular culture, I, don't, I can't. What makes me laugh? Popular culture. Are there any um, comedians that, that 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 do it for you? Yeah, I, I'm I'm a sucker for comedians. I kind of love them. I think they're all brilliant. You know, I love observational humor. Like I love the I love that that trick they all. I, I'm full of admiration for, and I love when they just put to, point out the uh, this absurdity of our life. You know, they're going through each day. You know, do we? And of course, COVID's made that worse. You know, you kind of put your mask on, you terribly worried, and then you take your mask off and your fingers are all over it you put it in a disgusting pocket and then you put it back like i yeah. you know the that's a bad example but you know there's just a, i love that modern life is is kind of absurd on many levels that we're not and we're not we're not meant to live like this right we're not we haven't been we haven't you know, we were all of modernity's happened in a flash of an eye. We, we've been anatomically modern for like two hundred thousand years, and then we spent the last two hundred years living in high-rise buildings and surrounded by 
metal and eating weird food in a microwave like it's just it's it's madness and so i think that any i love comedians who kind of point that out and and revel in it and just te- just remind us all the time that none of this is normal okay. <laughs> and so uh, yeah so i, I but i'm yeah i'm not i'm not very particular I, I joe brand you've mentioned i think is absolutely brilliant for example she's one of the few comedians i've met her in the flesh lots of times you meet comedians they're not that funny in real life and it must be very stressful because they must go around thinking, oh my God, I'm supposed to be so funny all the time. And I'm just bloody miserable. And Joe Brand's genuinely and effortlessly funny all the time. And, and I, I'm such a huge admirer of hers. Yeah, and, and lovely as well. A yeah. wonderful person. No, she yeah. really is. Tell me a true funny story about something that's happened to you. Well, that's obviously a dangerous thing to say because n- n- the story, the funniness will be lost in the telling. Lots, I mean, filming is around the world uh, pr- pr- provides moments of great hilarity uh, well, not often at the expense of others one i was filming with a guy called will in rome once and he we were in a sewer and there was just poo and we just sloshing around our, our thighs we were wearing these sort of overalls and he kept walking when you're in a sewer let me tell you the big problem is you don't know where the floor is because you assume it's you actually because you can't see the bottom and he just kept walking and he just just and obviously he just disappeared off the edge into a kind of sump, and just disappeared. Camera, a uh, hundred thousand pound camera, and and him went uh, oh, yeah, totally under underwater, uh, quote unquote. And he was then we had rescued him, and there was a manhole, and we pushed him out to the top of the manhole cover, and he came out in the Roman Forum, and he was covered head to toe in sewage. And he was, this had happened before to people. So there was an Italian decontamination, or sort of part of the health and safety had been these decontamination guys were around. And he then had to strip off entirely naked in the middle of the Roman Forum with <laughs> all these tourists just looking at He's just emerged from the ground. He's covered in shit. And he's now being decontaminated naked in the middle of the Roman Forum, which was a source of extraordinary happiness to everyone that everyone that witnessed that. Um, the other one, a funny, a funny one that I've just remembered is we had, we had making a TV show. We had Sheila Hancock on the show, who's kind of grand old dam of, of British sort of broadcasting. I heard in the, the, the rehearsal script, I was, I, was ho- I was the sort of presenter and we'd go from interview Sheila Hancock to a VT, like a video about some bit of history and something else. The, the, the script had changed. I was like, hold it, it was five minutes before air. We're doing last at rehearsal. I was like, sorry, I just heard that. Why, why is the auto, why is the script change? It's about the, the next film's about the sinking of the Bismarck. And I was about to say, uh, Sheila Hancock's interview had gone and she was back in the green room. And the next thing was about the, the uh, sinking of the Bismarck. And the script change said, you know, the sink, it had previously said it changed the course of the war at sea. And, and it didn't say that anymore. So I quite like that line. And the voice came back from the, the director going, yeah, we ran it by Sheila Hancock and she didn't think that the sinking of the Bismarck changed the course of the war at sea. And I'm like, I mean, oh, I don't care what she, I mean, I love, what, I don't care what Sheila Hancock thinks about 1941. Like, what, I mean, have I got absolutely bananas? There's a few oh, well, and, and now with the history hit, you run everything past Sheila Hancock, of course. Yeah. I mean, she's the absolute, yeah, she's the, she's the fact checker. <laughs> I love that, Dan. Do you think everyone is potentially funny or is it, you know, just a gift given to the few? Oh, I think everyone's potentially funny. Yeah, I think everyone's potentially funny. I think humour often comes from, it's being highly observant, it's being smart, but it also comes from adversity. I certainly tried to be funny to make people like me when I was a teenager because I was a sort of weird, gawky guy, a kid who didn't fit in. I think also humour is is not genetically inherited, but inherited from your upbringing. You know, those families of people that are super funny because the, the, the discourse is funny, they're energetic and, and the joke's made and there's, there's a constant churn of humour. So yeah, I think, um, and often you meet comedians who say, I'm definitely not the funniest person in my family, but I was the one who sort of did it professionally. So what would the world be like without humour? It would be a grim, it would be a grey place, wouldn't it? It would be super grim. It would be a place where it, one of the humour is one of the few weapons, as we've talked about in this podcast, it's one of the few weapons that those who are deprived of power, the powerless have, uh, we can laugh. Humour is one of the few things. I've talked to a lot of black American historians and, and they they talk a lot about humour in the black American community, the legacy of slavery, legacy of marginalization and and racism if faced and 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 the same you'll know from from your family your tradition of in eastern europe and and under the soviet union humor was in in many ways essential to survival i think you're right well you you say humor is essential to survival in history there haven't been that many leaders that i know about but you're the expert who have been quoted as being funny i mean churchill 
obviously is one who has several quotes, you know, the, the stuff with Nancy Astor and, you know, when Nancy Astor says to him, you know, sir, if I were your wife, I would poison your coffee. And he said, if, if I were your husband, I would drink it. You know, those kind of things. It, who else in history is funny? Oh, I think lots of people are funny. I think Abraham Lincoln was funny. I think many leaders have been funny. Uh, I think that Wellington was a bit funny. Maybe I don't know if he intended to be funny, but he certainly his put downs are very impressive. Um, I, I think I think you know Sir Robert, Sir Robert Walpole was funny again. You know, humour it depends on the audience and the place. But I think Sir Robert Walpole, Walpole was funny. He he was able to he peppered his speeches, House of Commons, with with humour that showed him to be a crusty Norfolk gentleman. He showed the backbenchers. He was on their side. He got them, um, and so he was he was funny and that helped to keep him prime minister for around 20 years so it's you know almost cre well created the office of prime minister virtually and, and cemented him in it for a long time so i think humor is a way that uh so, you know and being self-effacing is a part of humor and is essential people think especially in the uk people think self-effacement people think being sort of modest even false humor is, is it kind of essential to any leader that's the great difference between the us and, and britain and i've talking to someone who, who who does university applications and they say it's a complete catastrophe because the british professors will write you know that your your person giving your references your referees will sort of say yeah they're, they're quite they're quite good and the americans go we don't want quite good we want the best <laughs> You know, what are you talking about? And so it's a huge problem with communication. But in Britain, for those listening abroad, it, and if you meet new people, you have to be ostentatiously self-effacing for about the first three hours to, to make sure <laughs> that everyone doesn't think you're a dick. And particularly, actually, if you're six foot six, you know, and have physical presence. Because I, I, I've, I've, I walk into a room, I'm gigantic, and I have to particularly spend a lot of my time going, oh my God, I'm such a fucking idiot. Uh, and then that, I, you get a, be a better response from people. It's the laughing at you, being able to laugh at yourself, isn't it? Which which evens things up, especially in British society. And actually on, on stage, my background's on, in the comedy store and everything, on stage, most comedians, I mean, Joe Brand, who we were just talking about, would point out, first of all, their character traits. I mean, Joe used to get the mic and the first thing she'd do it was go... I'll move this so you can see me, you know, and yeah, yeah. and those kind of things are, are are very important in the thing. The Humorology project is all about how can we introduce more more humor into business and to life so that people can get more out of it. If I asked you to write a business case for humor, what would you include in it? Humor is essential. It doesn't matter if you're in a business or in a, a military situation, political situation, any situation in which you need to develop relationships, in which you need to extract concessions, in which you need to build unity, create teams. Humor is, what is, is essential. Humans have got several tools at our disposal. We've got violence. You can whack people. You can prod them, stab them and kick them, bite them. You can um, inspire people. You can We can use our words to paint a picture of a, of a unifying dream, of, of, a, of a mission that will make us all healthier, richer, stronger, have a better afterlife, what, you know, whatever it is. Or you can appeal on a pragmatic level. You can say, I'll give you money and I'll, uh, you know, and, and, you'll, and you'll get a Mars bar. Um, or, or you can use humour. These are simply the suite of things that we have available when it comes to persuasion. And so if, if you're ignoring humour, you have to ignore violence, I think, probably in most businesses, I hope you are. But you should not ignore humour. It's one of the few tools you have available to cement leadership, to create trust, to create good feeling. We all know at the beginning of Zooms, we all make a joke about the person that's muted. I mean, you, if you don't get, if you're not able to do humour, again, it could be a British thing, but I often, you know, I often think when I start an email, I think it's nice to start. It's very, very British and actually probably quite, rather than just launching in with, I need you to send me this attachment today, you just launch in with a, you know, uh, we all thought, you know, make a joke about the weather, which in Britain is easy because the weather is unbelievably bizarre and humorous. Or you make a joke about the politics or the endless lockdown we're enduring because we're recording this now at the end of a at the end of Britain's third lockdown during the COVID crisis. So the business case for humor is like saying, what's the business case for using inspiring language or for creating safe, psychologically safe workplaces. It's a huge pillar of how we communicate with each other, how we understand each other, how we give and take from each other. And if you're not addressing humour, you're, you're not 
using the full arsenal at your you know that that you have at, at, at the your potential arsenal absolutely i couldn't agree more it's perfect i know that as a speaker and you're a great speaker i've seen you speak at a thing you you talk about lessons in leadership that can be given to people from people like alexander the great genghis khan napoleon and the like in those lessons in leadership what comes out to you and is there any correlation with leadership and humor yeah, no, there is. Well, we all know. We all know bosses. We've all worked for people who are, are, are kind of bereft of humour. It's it's a bit unsettling, really. It's worrying. It's if you can't share a smile and a, a, a laugh at the, as you say at the outset of a meeting or at the end of it, or walking through the corridors towards it, or when you when you're leaving the office, if it, then that person feels distant, cold. Humour is a way that we reinforce intimacy. There's, there's just no two ways about it. So Nelson, with his captains, there was laughter in the in the in the great cabin of victory. There was there was discussion of tactics, and but there was there was informality there. Of course, there was. There had to be. He had to persuade his captains to fight the battle in the way that he intended the Battle of Trafalgar. That you, you can't just issue the orders and then tell them what you, you know. That you can't just send them all a letter and expect them to behave. He gathered them together. He talked about it. They ate. They broke bread. They drank together. They 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 laugh they shared that's that's what we do it's what we do we, we smile we laugh it's what people have found so difficult about zoom and it's what i find a bit sus- suspicious about the idea we're all going to work remotely I, I i'm not maybe i'm old and and i'm too uh resistant to change but but i think small group bonding is essential in so many businesses maybe not in your business but in mine it is where we need to come up with ideas we need to make things work we need to we think let's make a program on d-day what are we going to put it let's put this let's put that how are we going to do it let's get a seaplane and land it off the coast of normandy that's a brilliant idea now that's something that only comes about when you're in a intimate human setting i think the human is essential in marriage as we know goodness me if you can't laugh together if you can't laugh at your misfortunes and the kind of you know the baby that's pooed on the thing and the food that's spilled on the thing and the house being in a tip you can't laugh about that then what have you got well yeah and, and i would argue as, as from the psychological standpoint that what it does is it adds resilience as well on that level whereby if you're laughing at something it diminishes in, in importance and if you if you can't laugh at it you end up getting frustrated and that leads to all kinds of problems in businesses and in the world we've coming to the end part of our our show which we like to call quick fire questions quick fire questions quick fire question number 1 dan Who's the funniest business person you've ever met? The funniest business person I've ever met is probably John Spence, who's chairman of the Karma Group of Hotels. Oh, OK. What, what does he do that's different and better? Oh, he's just got a wonderful outlook on life. He tells funny stories about his failures and his you know, he jokes about himself. He's cheerful. He's, you know, he's just, a, he's just jolly. He's jolly as hell. What book makes you laugh, Dan? So actually, it's very, as you asked me that, it's a bit depressing. I, I read very few fiction books now because I'm always reading history books. Yeah, I think you know, even the more on P.G. Woodhouse, I think made me laugh a lot when I was younger. Bill Bryson, you know, I just that those early Bill Bryson books I thought were so oh, funny. They're superb. Bill Bryson was uh, wonderful. What film makes you laugh, Dan? I used to guffaw all the the Will Ferrell and the, the Vince Vaughn films. I think I'm slightly growing out of that now, unfortunately, because I watched one again on the plane the other day and I still had a bit of a giggle, but I didn't find it absolutely back-slappingly hysterical as I did in my 20s. So there's n- nothing new that's come out or you just don't have time? You've got young children? I, so yeah, you- I haven't. Yeah, I haven't watched any adult comedies for a long time, actually. No, I mean, I'm, I'm one of these terrible people. I'm, I spend a lot of time watching short films on TikTok and, and Twitter and, 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 you know, I, I watch a lot of that. I don't watch a huge amount of um, big old-fashioned Hollywood comedy drama anymore. You know, that, well, that's time, I think, is mm. probably the enemy. What word makes you laugh? I think the word thespian is so absurd. It has to, for, for actor, it just makes me laugh. And I've got a sister that's an actor. And when people drop in thespian, meaning actors and people in the acting community, I just I can't contain myself. <laughs> These are funny. OK, now we take, go to the other end of the spectrum. What is not funny? The climate crisis is not funny. It's just unbelievably awful. Um, and uh, and our, our our response to it is not funny. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. So you've got a double first from Oxford. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Well, as someone who's never really had to think about that choice, because I've never been considered either, I would say, would I rather be considered clever or funny? God, 
I think I'd probably be, I think I'd, it'd, be, it'd be nice to be funny. It'd be nice if people said, oh, that guy's so funny. That'd be a fun thing to be. Some people on the show uh, w- want both, basically. And I, I'm of the belief that actually in order to be funny, and uh, uh, we have mutual friends who, uh, who think you're very funny, which is you have to be clever. Yeah, most... no question. No question. Yeah, I mean, are all the funniest people you know quite clever? Yeah, I mean, as you know, I'm I'm such a big fan of John Lovett in the states. I've listened to all his podcasts, and you know, he's fantastically clever. And as a result, and, and very very funny, he used to be Barack Obama's speechwriter. If people don't know, and he used to put the jokes. And in fact, he's partly responsible for the roasting Barack Obama gave Donald Trump in the press association sort of dinner, which is one of the reasons Trump ran for president. So that that yes. backfired. So, um, but no, I think I think he, you know people like him are, have to be brilliant before they can be funny and finally dan desert island gags you can only take one gag with you to a desert island what is it Uh, the the honest answer is i've got absolutely no idea but i I don't know why but this one's popped into my head which is just so embarrassing but i quite like it i like a bit of old gentle you can tell your grandma wordplay in which it takes advantage of the the kind of linguistic peculiarities of, of english and there's that thing like my wife and i are going to the caribbean Jamaica? No, she went of her own accord. Like I, like I think that's kind of that I yearn for that kind of gentle nineteen fifties <laughs> sort of music hall banter. Uh, that would be quite an appropriate gag on a desert. Well, that's island. That's maybe why I thought about it. Yeah, it's a sort of desert. It's a sort of sandy island related joke. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, that's fantastic. Unfortunately, uh, this interview is now history. And I'd have to say, Dan Snow, thank you so much for being a guest on the Humorology podcast. It's been Thanks for having me. Thank you. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.